My name is David Iglesias. I run the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. I also teach here, and I have the privilege every couple of years to lead a study group, a political economy study group, to different places in the world. And this coming summer, I think we've got some students here who are planning on going, at least one that I see, uh, to the Abraham Accord countries. So you poli-sci majors will understand what the Abraham Accords are. It's historic normalization of diplomatic and economic relations between Israel and two of the Gulf states. Uh, so uh, this is um, perfect timing because the Consul General of Israel to the Midwest, Enam Cohen, will be speaking shortly. I'd like to introduce him and he's got a wonderful background. But before I do that, we use Slido here. And if you wanna submit questions, log in, log your phones onto slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the code 2231009. You should all have this little um, card. I also wanna talk about upcoming events that the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics is sponsoring. We're uh, doing a tribute on April 18th to Wheaton grad Michael Gerson, who was President George W. Bush's chief speechwriter. And we've got an all-star cast. David Brooks of the New York Times will be speaking. Pete Wainer, who writes for the Trinity Forum in Washington, D.C. And Scott Baker, who's a Wheaton grad and a former roommate to uh, Michael Gerson. April 24th, we'll also be having a data-driven debate at 7 p.m. at the Baki Auditorium next door. So I hope you can make those as well. But getting back to why you're here, it's to hear uh, Mr. Cohen um, speak about Israel, speak about the Abraham Accords, and how they are a model for world peace. His background is wonderful. Oh, uh, has a Bachelor of Computer Science from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, an MBA cum laude, was in the private sector as a strategic consultant at Sheldor Limited. And then he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where he was assigned duties as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Bogota, Colombia, where he learned some of the best Spanish I've ever heard. I need to say that. And he also uh, was stationed in Madrid as Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Israel in Madrid, Spain. Uh, he led the diplomatic dialogue with the Spanish government and outreach to Spain's parliament and political parties. So he's also uh, worked at the United Nations and before arriving to Chicago, he was a senior policy advisor to Foreign Minister Gabby Ashkenazi and director of the policy department at the Minnesota Bureau. Uh, he's got 16 years as a career diplomat with Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and he is relatively new to Chicago. Please give him a warm Wheaton College welcome, folks. Good evening, thank you, thank you. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Inam Cohen, and as mentioned, I'm the Consul General of Israel to the Midwest, based here in Chicago, but we cover a big chunk of this country, nine states. Um, you know, maybe before we start, I just want to uh, share some things about myself that has not, have not been mentioned in, in, in the background. Um, so I'm 46 years old. I have three kids who are here with me and basically have gone with me and my wife, of course, um, on, uh, you know, during my diplomatic career on, on, on different countries. Um, this is actually, here in Chicago, this is my fourth mission. As, as mentioned before, I started my career in Colombia, then I moved to uh, Berlin, Germany, then uh, to Spain, and I'm very happy to be here in Chicago. And since I was asked, I want to mention it also here, I, I, I was born 46 years ago in Jerusalem, uh, the capital of Israel. I'm a third generation in Jerusalem. My grandparents actually arrived as teenagers uh, from different countries, Arab countries. Um, they left their Jewish communities in, in, in Arab countries across the Middle, East, uh, the Middle East and arrived in the 1930s, even before the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, to what was then for them the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, where they established their homes. And my parents were born in Jerusalem 
um, a year before the establishment of the State of Israel. This year we're going to celebrate uh, 75 uh, years to our independence. Um, major events are going to be in May, but since it's a nice number, 75, so we want to celebrate it uh, for an extended, extended period of time, so it's going to be um, a wonderful year. For example, as I mentioned to the president um, and, and, and the leadership of this college, I'm going tomorrow to uh, Springfield to, uh, to address the, the House of Representatives of Illinois on the occasion of, of, of our 75th anniversary. And we try to celebrate it all across the Midwest. We cover the Midwest, nine states, so we try to, uh, to celebrate it in a, on, on, on every Midwestern state that, uh, that we do. Um, just very briefly, because this is not the theme of, of what I'm going to talk about, but you know, people ask me, and I was asked uh, this evening too, what does a consulate do? So what we do, ju ju just to give you a short brief, is we represent Israel in the Midwest. Um, we, as representatives of Israel in America and the United States, it is very important to share with you uh, that for us, the United States is, is, is our most important and close ally in the world. Uh, our relations with the United States are like no, you know, no other country in the world. It is very special, very unique, and what we try to do here is to make sure that our partnership and our alliance with the United States grows bigger in the Midwest. So we talk a lot to politicians, we try to do much more, to bring, facilitate much more business between Israel and the Midwest. There's amazing opportunities, but I think, I mean, we, we should do much more to see the full potential of, of what we can do together. And we also work a lot with communities across the Midwest, here in Chicago and all across the Midwest. Uh, we try to reach out to communities and to create partnerships with communities, um, not only with politicians and you know, academics and business people, but also with communities. So we work a lot in the south side and the west side of Chicago, here in Chicago. We do it in many other cities in the Midwest. We try to create partnerships with uh, Latino communities, African-American communities, and other uh, communities to, to, we want, to make sure that our relations, the Israeli-American relations, are not focused in one group, but are very, very diverse. That the relations are as diverse as this country is. And this is what we try to do. Let me give you a very quick brief about Israeli diplomacy. And this is the first slide. Because you know, I don't know, has any of you ever been to Israel? Oh, that's a nice number. OK, you probably know that Israel is a very small country, right? It's, if you look at Lake Michigan, which is not a big, just a dot in this, in this map, so Israel is, uh, Lake Michigan is three times bigger than Israel. Okay, we're a very small country. At the same time, our population is, is around, we're reaching, nearing uh, 10 million people. So we're a, dense, a small country with relatively big population for the size of the country that we are. Um, and if we look at our, uh, this map is of course in Hebrew, I don't expect you to read or understand, but you can get the idea of the map. And if you look at the colors, you see that this is a, a map that describes our foreign relations, as you can see. And it's a very colorful map, but you see some chunks of white uh, countries that are not colored in any color, they're white. So these countries uh, represent, these are the countries with which we do not yet have diplomatic relations. And if you look at the map, you see that the vast majority, majority of them are in the Middle East. Okay? So I refer to their, that later on, but um, this, this is our biggest, yet remains our biggest diplomatic challenge uh, in, in the world. You can also see, I don't know, how much you can see Venezuela and Cuba, two countries with which we don't have with Venezuela, we used to have with Cuba, you know, it's complicated, but we don't have yet diplomatic relations. And some Muslim countries in East, um, Southeast Asia, referring to Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and this is, remains one of our biggest diplomatic challenges. Now, for the size of the country, that we are, we're a very small country, even though you tend to sometimes hear more uh, about us in the news, but remember that we're a small country and for the size of our country, we have uh, quite an extensive net of diplomatic network. Um, today, Israel has uh, more than 100, actually 108 diplomatic representations around the world. This is a lot. I don't know if you know that, but this is a lot for a country of our size. Countries of our size, like Belgium, for example, in Europe, 
would have much less representations. Uh, only in America, only in the United States, we have nine diplomatic representations. That's our embassy in Washington and eight consulate generals that are all across this country. This one is the best, of course, in Chicago, but there are many others in minor cities like New York, Los Angeles, and others. And um, why is that? Especially because of the unique situation of Israel in the world. Um, and I would give you a short review of that. Because of um, historic lack of acceptance in some areas of the world, especially in the Middle East, but not only there, also in Asia, in Africa, for some time. Today, our relations with Africa are amazing. Uh, in other places, uh, we felt that we need to be much more present than usual countries in our size to make our case, to make our case sound. So this is why we have a very uh, in intensive and extensive net of, of, of diplomatic uh, missions of consulates and embassies. Now, I want, can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, this is our immediate region of reference. This is the Middle East. I don't know how, if the colors are great, this is the Mediterranean Sea, All right? This is Europe, this is North Africa, and the Middle East. That is in many, uh, you know, is referenced to in many cases as the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa. Um, it is a region that is one, predominantly Muslim, the countries are mostly Muslim there. And it has, and in most cases, uh, and they're in the vast majority of the countries are also very are Arab, with other minorities were Arab. And this is, and this tiny little dot in the middle is Israel, in purple, if you can see. As I said, very small country. Um, our relations with the Arab world have been very, very complicated in the three first decades of our existence, in the, in the 50s, in the 60s, and the 70s. You know, Israel was established in 48. Um, is, Israel was established uh, based on a UN resolution, which um, was not accepted by, by many of our neighbors. So unfortunately, we had known some uh, local wars, which only after quite a substantial toll of, of, of death and suffering in the region have led some of our neighbors to understand that peace is better than war. That's always the case. So in 78, 1978, actually we signed it in 1979, we celebrated the first peace agreement with an Arab country, that was Egypt. I was only three years old when it was signed, so that's, that's, a, that's something we had for, uh, for, for, for many years now, our peace with Egypt, which was followed um, 25, I was, I've always been bad in math. 15 years later, sorry, with our second uh, peace agreement with Jordan. So our biggest neighbors, Jordan and Egypt, we've had peace for, with them for decades now. And that has peace, I, I want to tell you something about this peace. It was a very important peace, it was strategic peace. It was peace that supported the, the regional stability and the security in the region. But at the same time, there were peace agreements that were basically Basically, agreements between the institutions, between the governments, between the, the military establishments, less genuine peace between the peoples. And it's very relevant because I'm going to say something about it when I talk about the Abraham Accords. In 1993, we had the biggest experiment till now in doing peace with our most immediate uh, neighbors, that is the Palestinians. With the Oslo Accords that were signed in 93, the idea was to move gradually towards uh, full peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Unfortunately, because of various reasons, I'm not gonna go into all of them, um, the experiment did not succeed well. And we still do not have, um, we do not have peace with our neighbors, with our, uh, our Palestinian neighbors. I hope that would change soon. And for many years, that has also prevented many other Arab countries from establishing peace uh, with Israel. Um, so what happened, and now we can speak about that openly, that wasn't the case until three years ago, is that we did maintain peace with, uh, not peace, sorry, we did maintain relations with many Arab countries around us, but they were clandestine relations. We even had, it sounds like James Bond, but it was real. Some of my fellow diplomats served in Arab countries, 
in clandestine repre uh, representations. Now that is, that is an, you know, the whole goal of a diplomat, the whole idea about being a diplomat is to be able to be seen, to talk, to represent your country. There were diplomats who worked as secret agents. They were there in Dubai, for, in Bahrain. They were there. Very, very few people there knew that they were Israel representing our country. And for the, you know, most people they met, they had a different identity. But that helped us in a very unique way, maintain relations with super important countries in super relevant, uh, on super relevant issues, even when they weren't able to maintain official relations with Israel. Can we move on to, all right, just a second, we'll reach to that. And then came September 2020, um, the Abraham Accords. I have to admit, back then, as was mentioned, I worked as the policy advisor to the previous foreign minister, Gabi Ashkenazi was his name. So I have to admit I was very close to the policy making, but the Abraham Accords came as a big surprise to all of us. I don't want to go into the background how and why. There were many reasons, but it started as a news that caught us in, in a total surprise, shock even. It news that the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, two Arab countries, together with more, uh, two uh, Gulf countries. Can we go back, sorry, to the map? Two Gulf countries in the Persian Gulf, that's here. That's the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Together with Morocco and North Africa, are willing or are wanting to sign peace with Israel. And that was big news. You know, when I talk to Americans in many cases, I feel that they do not understand what's a big deal. It's all right, so you have relations with a new country. Right, what's a big deal? I think you have to understand the situation in Israel to get the idea what it, wh why it is so big. Israel is the first, as I said, is a tiny country. We're surrounded, we're actually an island, even though we're not. Why are we an island? Because we're surrounded with countries with which some of them we do not have any relations. So I can't just take my car and go to Wisconsin or Michigan, or in our case, to Lebanon and Syria. If I want to go out of my country, I have to take a flight wherever I go. And it's usually northwest to Europe because most of our surrounding territory is blocked for us. And that, that, that cha that, the Abraham Accord changed that dramatically, and I want to explain to you how. Can we move on? But before that, I want to share with you some personal stories uh, from my private photo album. I didn't take official photos, but just personal photos of mine. This is the boarding pass in a frame. It's in my office. People would ask, why do you, why do you, why do you keep a boarding pass? Who cares? But this is a boarding pass of the first official flight from Israel, from Tel Aviv to Bahrain. I was on board of this flight. It's dated to uh, September uh, 20. It was maybe two weeks after the Abraham Accords were announced. We didn't yet have peace agreements. We didn't sign the agreements. I was on the board together with an Israeli-American delegation to Bahrain. Again, the first official flights. There were some clandestine unofficial flights, but the first official flight to Bahrain went to the Royal, can we move on? Uh, yeah, that's when we landed. We went to the Royal Palace. We landed in Bahrain. By the way, it was September. They told us welcome. It's the first day of the autumn in Bahrain. The temperature was 95 degrees on this day. <laughs> um, we went to the Royal Palace, which was surrounded by, uh, you know, um, oil fields. Just like in the movies, we were discussing with, with Crown Prince and his team, the, final, the fa final details of the agreement. Then I came back home the same day uh, after, a few, um, after a few hours on, on, on Bahraini land. And I always tell that, I like this story. I came back home and my wife asked me, how was your day? I told them, you know, I went to Bahrain to, to discuss uh, our, our future peace agreement. How was your day? Uh, so it was, it was, it was nice. C can we go back to the map? And I want you to, to the next one. Please, thank you. So again, this is Israel, and Bahrain is a tiny dot here in the Persian Gulf. And for the first time ever, for me, and for an Israel, official Israeli flight, we had to go over a Saudi territory. Now, again, Saudi for us, Saudi Arabia is something, is, is, is a kingdom beyond the, 
I don't know, beyond the, how do you say, beyond the horizon. Something that we don't know, we only heard in stories, we weren't allowed there, we're still not allowed to go visit there. But just being able to fly over the Saudi desert, we got an, a special permission from Saudi Arabia to fly over the territory. Looking down at the, at the Saudi desert and just thinking, me, you know, an Israeli guy flying over Saudi desert, hopefully one day we'll be also able to visit there. So that was a very, very special moment, very special day for me. Can we move forward? Another, another one more please. Another um, moment that was very uh, transformational for me was just one month later, I went together with my boss, with Israel's foreign minister, that's the guy to the right of the picture, you see the two guys that are leading, walking together with the Emirati foreign minister. That was the first official meeting between an, Israel minister, an Israeli minister and an Emirati minister. And I don't know if you can see the background, but I can tell you that that's Berlin, Germany. Have you ever been to Berlin, Germany? Anybody? All right. So for those of you who were, you can probably recognize that this is the Holocaust Memorial that is uh, situated in the, in, really in the heart of Berlin, in the center of Berlin. Now that was a huge moment because they were accompanied, the Israeli minister and the Emirati minister were, were hosted and accompanied by the German foreign minister. And for me, you know, I just looked from, from the outside at them and I thought, I couldn't have thought of a more symbolic moment because that was, and you know the Jewish history in Germany and the Holocaust. And, and, and for me, it was seeing the son or the grandson, descendant of, of the Nazi murderers. Today, Germany is a close friend of Israel, but that's a descendant of the Nazi uh, 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 murderers hosting an Israeli foreign minister who, by the way, is a son of a Holocaust survivors, together with an Arab minister. And what's special about that is the Holocaust denial in the Arab world is still very, very high. So the actual fact that the first meeting was taking place in this specific location sent a huge message to the whole Arab world about the importance of the Jewish history and the Israeli narrative about the need to accept, the, and, uh, about the need for acceptance of, to mutually accept that both Israelis and Arabs need to mutually accept each other's narrative. So that was a very, very special moment. And right after that, that's just a photo of the press conference that the three ministers held when they actually announced the details of, of the upcoming agreement between Israel and, and, and uh, the United Arab Emirates. So this is my personal stories, experience from, from the process that led to the Abraham Accords. And can we move on? Um, all right, let's leave this uh, slide. So why did it actually happen? What made the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans decide that, all right, it's time to, to, to sign official, public peace agreements with Israel? I can think of a few uh, elements that I want to share with you. Think first. I think that's the Israeli innovation. I don't know how many of you know, but Israel is referenced by many as a startup nation because it's a very, very innovative country with a lot of high-tech innovation. Actually, about 400 global companies have located their R&D centers in Israel. I'm talking about Microsoft, Google, Facebook, General Motors, um, just name it, from the United States, from Europe, and from Asia. So it's, it's, it's a huge hub of innovation in Israel. It's very vibrant. And as, as many of the Gulf countries are moving forward, trying to be more, less dependent on their energy resources, on, on oil and gas, and to convert into being more innovative country, you know, base their economies on, 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 on innovation, um, Israel was a natural partner. So that, that was the first thing. Secondly, I think especially in the Middle East, there is a growing understanding of the need of, of regional cooperation. Regional cooperation on water, because water resources are scarce in the Middle East. Um, regional cooperation on energy, because the Gulf countries export a lot of, still export a lot of energy, oil and gas to the whole world. And Israel is also becoming a gas exporter because there is huge reserves of, of, of gas in the Eastern Mediterranean. So it's a convergence of interest. Even of, of, of uh, transportation. 
Israel is, is located, even though we're a small country, on a very strategic location on the Eastern Mediterranean. If you want to go, for example, gas pipes or rail, uh, uh, tr uh, train rails from the Gulf countries to the Mediterranean, Israel is a natural partner. So a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, um, you know, regional uh, interest. Another very important element is a global threat or a common threat that both Israel and moderate Arab countries in, in the Middle East have, and that is Iran. Iran first by its nuclear ambitions, but also with its regional malign activity is threatening not only Israel, but also many of the Arab countries. Think of Lebanon, think of Syria, think of Iraq, think of Yemen. All countries where the Iranian involvement is very high and it turned them into failed countries. So many, many moderate Arab countries are looking at what Iran does in the Middle East and are very concerned. And I have to say that today, Iran is no longer just an Israeli or Mediterranean or Middle Eastern concern, it became a global concern. Because if you follow the news, you know that one of the biggest supporters of the Russian aggression today against the Ukraine is Iran, with the ongoing supply of missiles and, drone, and drones, attack drones. Um, so Iran was, I would say, mutual concerns of, of, of Israel, moderate Arab countries, and of the United States, of course. And that also led to uh, the understanding that we need to work together. And I would also want to refer to some of the history. You know, Morocco, for example. Morocco in North Africa once had a huge Jewish community. The vast majority of them live today in Israel or in France or in Canada. In Israel, there is around one million, one million of our citizens, Israelis, are descendants of, of Moroccan Jews. And they have always remained very, very much connected to their Moroccan heritage, to the state of Morocco, to the to the Moroccan palace, to the Moroccan king. And the fact that, that this connection remained even with, when we did not have relations, Israel and Morocco. It always remained. And now both Moroccans and Israel knew that once we have relations, it would just burst. And that's what happened. We have daily flights to Morocco. Tens of thousands of Israelis go to Morocco to really celebrate with the local Moroccans, the Muslim Moroccans, the, the, the Jewish heritage of Morocco, because Jewish heritage in Morocco is really part of the Moroccan heritage. It's really part of the country's heritage. So, so this is also something that binds us together. Now, uh, lastly, I want to just share with you, because I want to leave some time for Q&A, some of the, I think, biggest accomplishments of, of the Abraham Accords. Uh, so first, as I said, as I started, the Abraham Accords unlike maybe previous peace agreements that we had with Egypt and Jordan, is truly peace between the peoples. It's a genuine peace between the peoples. Just, look, I mean, the amount of Israeli tourists that go today to Gulf countries is amazing. Something that three years ago was unthinkable. Really amazing. Like three, three flights a day, flights are packed. It's, it's, it's really impressive. But it's not only about tourism. It's about business. More than 1,000 1, Israeli companies operate today at the United Arab Emirates. Um, look at the numbers. I don't know if there is business uh, students here, but you don't have to be a business student to understand the, the numbers. In 2020, just two years ago, when, when the Abraham Accords uh, were signed, the volume of, of trade, of business, between Israel and the United Arab Emirates was around $300 million. It sounds a lot, but it's, it's not really a lot. One year later, it grew in, in, in more than 400% uh, uh, to 1. 1. 1. 3, 4, 5, I'm not sure about the number. Just in one year. Find me a company that can raise its, its income in 400%. In I'm going to buy all its stocks today. Uh, then a year, a year after that, in 22, it became already 2.5 billion. And the expectation is that 2020, in 2024, we'll have $5 billion of exchange. That is dramatic. It's big. It creates a lot of job and wealth, jobs and welfare, both in the Arab countries and in Israel. The Negev Forum. The Negev is a desert in the south of Israel. It actually constitutes almost half of, this, of, of the territory of our country. Half of our country is actually a desert, one big desert. That is in the south. The, desert, the Negev has be also become a symbol of Israeli innovation because it's a very arid uh, territory that was uh, um, um, 
you know, which has seen grow, uh, a lot of growth with uh, communities in agriculture in arid places because of Israeli water te technologies. So the Negev Summit was a summit that was hosted just last year uh, by our now four, uh, previous uh, foreign minister that was, uh, that was taken uh, in the summit. And you see him in the middle together with the Egyptian foreign minister, with the Bahraini foreign minister, with the Secretary of State of America, Secretary Blinken, with uh, the Moroccan foreign minister, with the Bahraini. That is now a genuine partnership that is created in the Middle East. It wasn't just a one-time meeting. It is a forum that is now dealing on a regular basis on all the aspects of cooperation in the Middle East, on water, how to make the, life, the lives of people in the Middle East better. Water technologies, medicine, um, agriculture, everything that has to do with our everyday life of the people of the Middle East. Can we move forward to the last slide? Yes, this is another um, um, great accomplishment of, of, of the Abraham Accords. That is the I2U2 Summit. Do you know what the I2U2 stands for? It's easy. I2 is Israel and India, and the U2 is United States and United Arab Emirates. That's the name of the forum. It was launched during uh, the last visit of President Biden in Israel in July 22. It was together there, together with uh, then uh, uh, Prime Minister Yair Lapid, the um, Prime Minister of India and the President of the United Arab Emirates. The Israeli and the American were together. The other two leader, leaders were online and the idea was to initiate a forum that is, what does Israel, India, the United Arab Emirates, Arab Emirates and, and the United States have to do together? Apparently a lot because all of us are very innovative countries, two huge countries and two very small countries, but with a lot of innovative ideas, with a wonderful geographic distribution, India, United Arab, Arab Emirates, Israel, and America. Okay, so, and we think of how we can work together, again, on various issues that are very relevant. I don't want to sound, to exaggerate, but really to the world population. Um, next week, we have a meeting of scientists Okay, from the countries of the I2, uh, U2 forum to, to discuss these issues. So these are just, I'm sharing with you, just huge things that just three years ago were unthinkable of, unthinkable of, and today they are, you know, just pure reality. So that was 30 minutes about the Abraham Accords and some Israeli diplomacy. Um, I could talk for two more hours, but um, let's open the floor for some questions. How about a hand for the Council General? Thank you. And, and, and just so he can uh, understand the visual, if you're going to be going this summer to Israel and the other Abraham Accord countries, could you raise your hand? Yeah, so we've got a good turnout here, uh, Mr. Council General. So uh, Slido is what we use here, sir, to ask questions. Sure. And I will read you the questions and uh, we get to vote on whether, whether or not we like the question. T typically the top vote getter gets the questions. It's very, it's very democratic. First question, do you see Saudi Arabia joining the Abraham Accords? If so, do you see it happening in the near or distant future? And if so, how significant would that be? Oh, this is the most uh, important question. Can we go back to the first slide, the, uh, the second one, the map of the Middle East? Saudi Arabia is, to some extent, the golden bullet. It is very, very, very significant. If there is something we want is for Saudi Arabia to join the Abraham Accords. Um, Saudi Arabia is a very conservative country, not only socially, they have made a great shift, you know, in their, relation, in, in their internal issues. Women have much more rights now than just five years ago and so on and so forth. But it's also very conservative in its handling issues. So, Changes in Saudi Arabia take time. And I want to say that I hope to see Saudi Arabia joining this year in 2023 to the Abraham Accords. I'm not sure if it's going to happen. I'm not sure if it's going to happen the way it happened with other countries. It might be more gradual, which means that we might not, 
the Middle East and Israeli embassy in, in Saudi Arabia, for example. But I do believe that gradual steps, steps are possible and we might see them even this year. But I want you to remember the one big accomplishment that took place with Saudi Arabia during the recent uh, President Biden visit to, to, to the region in, in July 2022 was when they allowed now officially to uh, flights that come in and out of Israel go over Saudi territory. Now, why is it important? Look at the map and you'll understand. That's Israel, again, and that's Saudi Arabia. Right, we can go obviously over Iraq and Iran. <laughs> so every Israeli flight that goes, or goes in or out of Israel to or from Asia, that is further on in the map, would have to bypass the Arab Peninsula, go south, then go again up and all the way to the east. And that added an average two hours to every flight from and to Israel going eastwards. Now with the Saudi permission, and that's a great development, to go over the territory, it cut the time of flights to India, to, to China, to Japan, to, to Singapore, to whatever country, to Thailand, in, the, in, in, the, um, in East Asia, in two hours. And that's very significant. It's significant to tourism. It's significant to business. It's significant to even cargo, you know, to, to lower prices in Israel. So it has a lot of side effects, but that was only the first step. And I truly believe that this year will show us more steps, and I can tell you that unofficially, there are things that go on, but I, I'm really hopeful that this year, year will show us more public steps until the final you know, agreement with the Saudis that I, I would really hope that happen in the upcoming years. Thank you. Second question is, how does China's increasing engagement with the Middle East, North Africa region affect Israel's relations with its neighbors? China. Yes, sir. That's a good question. Um, China is a very significant country in the world. Uh, it's very significant in terms of business, investments, technology. It's a huge market for Israeli companies in terms of technologies. Um, but of course, um, it sometimes has broader aspects uh, handling with China. Um, so I'm not sure to what extent it affects our relations with our neighbors, um, but everything that has to do with handling with China, we also take into consideration um, the perceptions among our American friends about doing business with China. Uh, and that is, that, is, that is an element in our relations with China. This is more of a personal professional question, but what prompted your shift from the private sector into foreign policy? What helped you with that transition? As you mentioned, I did my, uh, I under, my undergraduate, I undergraduated in computer science from a Hebrew U. I studied computer science for three years and I think I hated every moment of that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, then I did my master's in business administration, which was great, and, and I did work in the private sector, but I think my passion has always been to do something that is less technical and more global, to be able to represent my country. Uh, to be able to represent my country and also to build bridges between other countries and my countries, and especially to to do that in a global environment, not from Israel, but to be able to do that from other countries. And I think diplomacy really, that's the core of diplomacy, all these three elements. So that's where I found my destiny. Wonderful. Let me just give you a little bit of context uh, for this following question. Wheaton College has uh, produced U.S. ambassadors of foreign countries, chargés, and a large number of diplomats. And I know some of these students sitting out here are interested in diplomacy. So here's the question. Uh, regarding that. Uh, as a diplomat, you have strengthened Israel's foreign relations in complex contexts. Do you have any advice for those who hope to work in similar situations? Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> Please know that diplomacy is not just a job, it's a way of living. It affects every aspect of your life, of your family's life. It's not a nine to five job. 
It's 24-7, uh, but genuinely so, really. Because you work in different time zones, because when you're stationed abroad, you're the responsible, you know? You know, we once had a prime minister that was asked about how was the experience to, to, to become a prime minister? And he said, when I first entered the office, I looked up and I saw that there's, okay, let's assume God is above, but there's nobody above me. You know, I looked above and there's, there's no one to look to. I'm, I'm the responsible. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, the way we feel here, because we are here, the responsible, we are the re representatives of the country in, in a certain country or a certain area of a country, like me here in the Midwest, and it's a great responsibility. It's a great responsibility, and you have to be able to assume responsibility, not be afraid of taking responsibility, and especially, I think, you have to be very, very open. And this is something that is not natural to everybody, not even to myself, to be open to new cultures, to be able to embrace new cultures, because it's really hard. You know what? We come from a small country. I think it's even a bigger challenge for Americans, because you, ca you come from a, it's not only a big country, you come from a country that basically is a major, has a major role in shaping world's culture. So in many cases, you feel, and rightly so, that American culture is world culture. But then you go to other countries and you see that there's a lot of difference. And you have to be very, very gentle and very nuanced in, 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 in listening and, and understanding other cultures because that's the only key to, 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 to succeed in, in working with, with other people. Next question is this, how does Israel plan on expanding the Abraham Accords to include more nations in the Middle East? Yeah, that's a very important question. So the good news is that it is, we, we continue to do that. Uh, just last week, last month, saw two new countries, Muslim, one Muslim, one Arab countries, expanding peace with Israel. So the first one is Sudan. Sudan is, is, is the country that is to the south of Egypt. Um, in, in East Africa that was originally part of the Abraham Accords. Then because of their political situation, there was a coup d'etat, the, the army took uh, control of the country. Not great, so it was, they were held back. And uh, now, as there is prospects for uh, the legitimate civil government to come back to Sudan, we're working together. We had a visit in Sudan just uh, uh, two weeks ago, and we hope that Sudan integrates uh, soon in the Abraham Accords. We're actually already working on, on a nice ceremony in the White House sometimes when the democratic government returns to Sudan in the upcoming months. Another country, Sub-Saharan, Saharan country, not Sub-Saharan, Saharan country, that is Chad. I don't know how many of you, nobody has been to Chad, right? No chance. Uh, <laughs> Neither did I, but uh, it's a Saharan country. It's a huge country with a small population, uh, predominantly Muslim population with a big uh, Christian uh, minority. Uh, they also decided just recently, two weeks ago, to open an embassy in Jerusalem. So the process continues. But as I said, and let me, you know what? Let me share one more thing with you. When I worked with, with our foreign minister, I was usually when he had calls with his counterparts, in the United States, in Europe, in Arab countries, I was on the line taking notes. That was part of my job. Um, it was very exciting. I was I always, always very excited to do that because it's you know interesting things. I, I cannot share the names, but I can definitely tell you that we, he, had a lot of conversation with Arab countries with which we don't have yet diplomatic relations. And I'm very hopeful that the upcoming year would bring some more Arab countries or Muslim countries from the Gulf, uh, um, from the Arab Peninsula, from the Gulf region, or from uh, East Asia into the uh, circle of peace. And definitely our biggest hope is that Saudi Arabia joins sometime soon the Abraham Accords. Do you have any thoughts about why the uh, Abraham Accords happened first in the Gulf states and not in larger Arab nations like Iraq or Saudi Arabia? That's a good question. I've never, I've never given, it, given it a thought. My immediate answer would be the following. These countries, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, have actually never been involved 
in direct conflict with Israel. They're part of the Arab League, so for many years we didn't have relations. At some point they were even forbidden from doing any business with Israel, so on and so forth. But they, unlike Iraq or Syria or Lebanon, they have never been involved in direct conflict with Israel. Uh, Iraq, for example, took part in the Arab War against Israel when we declared our independence. Bahrain, the United Emirates were far away. They never took part of that. So I think they perceive themselves as something that is a bit different. They're Arab countries, but more of a Gulf countries, not pure Middle Eastern countries. And their whole perception, I think, is more global. And that helped in establishing relations with Israel. So our largest major at Wheaton College is business. So I know this follow-up question will resonate with our business majors and business professors. Uh, do you think the business aspect of Bahrain and uh, the UAE was helpful? Because uh, they, they, they're well known for their business practices, more so than a lot of the other Arab nations. Yes. Do you, and obviously Israel is doing quite well in business as well. Yes. Do you think that may have made a difference? Oh, for sure, for sure. As I mentioned, I think it's one of the, I think it's a, one of the major, major reasons that, you know, pushed them into, into into doing business with Israel because it's, it's, it's first pure business, making money, it's not bad, it's good, but also it's about regional cooperation that is where business is involved, water technologies. There is a lot of water industry, energy industry. Let me tell you just one example, which is wonderful. I'm still excited because, again, three years ago, impossible. It's called the Green Blue Partnership. It's a United Arab Emirate, an Emirati company is going to build a huge solar field in Jordan because there's a lot of sun in Jordan. The electricity that is going to be produced there is going to, some part of that is going to be exported to Israel. Israel is going to use this energy for a new desalin desalination plant that we're building on the border with Jordan because we have the technology. So we're gonna get energy, we're gonna use it for, to desalinize water, to create more water, potable water, for, because it's, we don't have so much of that. And this drinking water is going to be exported to Jordan. So the Emiratis get money and regional stability. Jordanians produce energy and get water. Israel gets energy, produces water, and gets regional stability. This is the kind of, it's business first, but also regional partnership that brings stability. So it's, it's, it's business, yes, but it's not only business. Business creates jobs and welfare, and that creates stability. Thank you. We have a lot of Bible theology majors also at Wheaton, and I'm sure they'd like to know why, what's the significance of the term Abraham Accords? Why is it called that? I think the copywriter of the term Abraham Accord should get a Nobel Prize. I think uh, the one, I'm not sure who, who I know who, who it was. That was, I mean, it, nobody could have ever thought of a better description. Why the Abraham Accords? Because we're all sons and daughters of the Abrahamic religions, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and, and, and Islam. And actually just last week, Abu Dhabi, in Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates, they inaugurated the Abrahamic Center, which constitutes of the first ever synagogue, official synagogue in Abu Dhabi. I'm not sure if it's the first, but there, there aren't many, if at all, uh, church and a mosque. So all three Abrahamic uh, worshipers can worship together at the same place on, on, you know, different, on the same location. And this is, I think, part of the spirit of the Abraham Accords, because again, it's not about only business or peace or stability. It's about peace between the peoples and peace between also the religions of the Middle East. And I should tell you, we are planning, for those of you that are going to the ISP this summer, we are planning on going to this location where there's the, the synagogue and the church uh, and the mosque. So that, that's been already presented. Just time for another couple questions. Uh, here's one that's really internal to Israel, but what suggestions do you have for helping mediate inter-Israeli relations between the Druze, Israeli, and Palestinian communities within oh, Israel? I thought you were gonna ask uh, about something else in Israel, internal issues. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Israel, all right, some background. So Israel is, is, is the homeland of the Jewish people. It's a, what we call a Jewish democratic country. So we have a majority of, or a majority of, of, of Jews, around 80%, and around 20, a bit more than 20% of our population are, are Arabs. The vast majority of them are Muslims, a small minority is Druze or Christians. Now, to mediate, you know, the Druze are not considering themselves a, a national minority. The, the, the Muslim and some of the Christians, yes. Um, we see more and more integration of our uh, Arab population in, in Israel's society. There is, you know, Supreme Court justices. Um, 47 of our medicine students are Arabs, for example, which means that in 10, 20 years, half of our doctors, physicians would be Arabs, which is great. That's a wonderful uh, integration. There's members of the parliament, ministers, fellow diplomats that are Arabs, of course, representing Israel. At the same time, yes, there is also significant challenges in, 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 in guaranteeing more equity to our uh, Arab population. The previous government adopted a bill of $10 billion, that's a lot in Israeli terms, in, in, in creating more equity in housing, in univer, uh, universal uh, healthcare, in, in, in more integration into our academia and our high-tech sector. So I truly believe that we're in the right direction. The challenges are still big, but we're in the right direction. Wonderful. Just need to check with my timekeeper. How are we doing on time? Final question. To what degree is future military cooperation with Arab states to deter Iranian aggression desirable or possible? I, didn't, I can speak about military cooperation in terms of desirable. Maybe yes. Any military interference uh, is, not, is not desirable. I hope that the Iranians would decide to disarm themselves and become a peaceful country, but I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so I think that partnership and cooperation between Israel and moderate Arab countries and another element that is super important, and that's the United States, states is, is very important. And to some extent, it already hap it, 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 it's happening already. Uh, one of the most exciting parts for me in the, in the Abraham Accords with Bahrain is the fact that one of the agreements we have established with Bahrain establishes a permanent Israeli military representation in Bahrain. There's an officer that, now think of that just three years ago, an Israeli officer permanently stationed in Bahrain in an Arab country that would be unimaginable and a major part of what they, they do, the idea of cooperation is to cooperate with the American Fifth Fleet, which is based in Bahrain. So I think to some extent it's, it's already happening. And we might need, the future might see uh, an, uh, an even a bigger need for, for such cooperation. I, I, I can't elaborate more because, not because I'm hiding something, because I do not know, but definitely the way the direction the Iranians go is not positive. Just yesterday, New York Times published that um, the, the UN uh, uh, monitors in Iran found uranium that is enriched to the level of 84%. Now, I'm not going to bore you with, with what it means with the technicalities, but that is a clear signal that Iran is moving forward very fast in building a military nuclear capabilities, not just civil nuclear capabilities, but military nuclear capabilities. And this is something, as I said, that is a threat not only to Israel, not only to moderate Arab countries, but I think to the whole world, so. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the Council General. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. I really appreciate your time.